Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory. We are here to read a couple of chapters from Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the first of the John Carter Warlord of Mars books. Um, just a reminder that I um, have placed a, uh, a little announcement on the Facebook page saying, by the way, it's now time to pick out a new book that we're going to start reading a week from today. In fact, uh, next Friday will be the start, and we'll be finished with Princess of Mars on uh, on Wednesday at uh, at 4 p.m. So um, we're, we're, we're coming up on uh, the time to choose a new title. This is a chance for you to express your feelings and express your interest in uh, in whatever you would like uh, to to read. And uh, I have some suggestions up on the Facebook page, but just keep in mind that uh, there's lots of other titles that are available, and if you have a better idea, by all means, please go ahead and, and just uh, list it in the comments. That'll be our where we vote. Vote in the comments, and um, and we'll see what what happens. Well, I you know look forward to uh, to reading whatever it is uh, you folks uh, pick out, and uh, you know as we just ask that it be uh, something that is in public domain, so that way we don't have to worry about you know uh, the reading rights and the right to actually you know broadcast it and that sort of thing. And uh, it makes it easy because it's usually available on Project Gutenberg, which is, a, you know, obviously a free site where you get be able to access these books for free. So check that out. If you have not yet, uh, go to the Facebook page for the Adventure and Mystery Book Club and uh, place your vote, if you would please. So in our previous two chapters on Wednesday, we um, read about... John Carter going to the um, city of Zodanga, and this the Zodangans are the hereditary enemy of the Red Martians of Helium. So there are Red Martians in both the ones who look more human, more Earth-like than uh, than the Green Martians, and um, as a result, uh, he has uh, he has snuck into Zodanga. He's looking for uh, the love of his life, Dejah Thoris, and he, when he goes, gets into Zadanga, the first thing that he does is he sees the Red Martian that he had met before uh, in captivity uh, with the War Hoons, Kantos Can, and he has ingratiated himself into the the, the Flying Corps, kind of like a little um, air force for the Zadangan army, and he tells John Carter. Uh, yeah, you should do that too. And of course, so John Carter does. And turns out he's really good at it, naturally. And he, uh, while he's flying around, he sees that there is a uh, another Red Martian who's in danger and he's about to be attacked by some, um, by some Green Martians. And he saves him. He's the, 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 the other, uh, the other man's flyer is not working, so he goes in and he saves him, and he earns a reward uh, for doing so, and uh, becomes the personal part of the personal guard of the Emperor of Zodanga. Now, um, I should mention that at this point that Zodanga is currently at war with Helium. They took took advantage of a time when the fleet of Helium was off looking for Dejah Thoris, and while the fleet was away, the Zodangans attacked, and um, it looks like they're going to defeat Helium. However, um, this is still an unpopular war with the people of Zodanga. They're kind of, I guess at this point, they're getting kind of tired of war, and there, there's a lot of warfare that seems to go on between the two peoples and between them, them and the green Martians. And basically everyone is at war with everyone else. So the people are getting tired of it. And the, the situation is, um, is not, not a very good one for, for the people of Zodanga. They're, they're unhappy with their ruler. So, uh, so bearing this in mind as this sort of in the background of what's going on, John Carter, uh, while, going around the, the, the main, I don't want to say castle, but it's sort of like there's a large um, uh, nobility uh, building that the, the Jeddak is, um, uh, which is their king, 
course, there's the Jeds, who are the, like princes, and then there's the Jedek, uh, one of them who uh, who is like the king. So their Jedek is living in this particular building, and while he is watching uh, over this king as a guard, he overhears that they have, in fact, Dejah Thoris as a prisoner in their dungeons. And not really a dungeon, it's actually much nicer than a dungeon. But um, this, you know, makes John Carter like, oh my gosh, she's here. And he suddenly realizes that now he's got to go save her. But uh, as it turns out, she comes into the throne room, if you will, and um, is talking to the Jeddak and one of the Jeds. And he, Cantos Can has already told him that one of the Jeds has fallen madly in love with Dejah Thoris. And so she goes there and she says, I have given much thought to your offer and I will marry you. And the Jeddak is very happy, of course, and the Jed is saying, well, this is wonderful. Now we can have a marriage between our two peoples and now we can we can end the war. And the 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 prince is like, okay, let's do it right now. Let's end the war now. And the 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 Jeddak, the king, is more like, well, let's let's do this a little more slowly. Let's take you know take advantage of kind of the the time frame here. We don't want to do anything too suddenly. And then he uh, you know he wants to see how the people of Helium uh, see if they will accept their peace. So, so there's that. Um, John Carter finds his way, he leaves his post as a guard, finds his way to the quarters where Dejah Thoris is being held, um, swiftly kills the four guards that are watching over her, and then says, come with me, my love, I have come to rescue you. And she says, you can't, um, and I can't, because I have already given my word that I would marry this prince. And he says, but, you know, and, and she apologizes. It's that she thought he was dead and, and he thought she was dead for a while. So everyone thought everyone else was dead. And, um, when, when they found, yes, but, but now, now, you know, I'm alive, so you can come with me and we can be together. And she's like, well, no, that's not the way it works here. I have given my word and once I give my word, I cannot go back on it. So I'm sorry that it worked out this way. I love you, she says. She says, you know, that she still wants to be with John Carter. That hasn't changed. But she has already given her her acceptance of the offer of marriage to this Jeddak. And, um, and she's not going to take it back. So so that's it. That's kind of where we, we, we leave it. John Carter makes his way out. He still hasn't quite given up hope, but he's looking around to see what he can do. Um, he finds out that even if he were to fight this Jeddak and kill him, it would still be against Martian uh, cultural norms to um, marry this woman uh, whose you know fiance she, he has killed. So, so he can't he can't get rid of this. Jeddak, he can't, or the, the Jed rather, he can't get rid of the Jed, and he can't um, convince Dejah Thoris to break her word, which is apparently something that does not happen on Mars. When you give your word, that's what happens. So, with this in mind, we will start chapter 23, which is entitled, Lost in the Sky. Without effort at concealment, I hastened to the vicinity of our quarters, where I felt sure I, could, I should find Cantos Can. As I neared the building, I became more careful, as I judged, and rightly, that the pl uh, place would be guarded. Several men in civilian metal loitered near the front entrance, and in the rear were others. My only means of reaching, unseen, the upper story where our our apartments are situated was through an adjoining building, and after considerable maneuvering, I managed to attain the roof of a shop several doors away. Leaping from roof to roof, I soon reached an open window in the building, 
where I'd hoped to find the Heliumite, and in another moment I stood in the room before him. He was alone and showed no surprise at my coming, saying that he had expected me much earlier, as my tour of duty must have ended some time since. I saw that he knew nothing of the events of the day at the palace, and when I had enlightened him, he was all excitement. The news that Dejah Thoris had promised her hand to Sabthan filled him with dismay. "'It cannot be!' he exclaimed. "'It is impossible! Why, no man in all Helium would prefer death to the selling of our loved princess to the ruling house of Zadanga. She must have lost her mind to have assented to such an atrocious, atrocious bargain. You, who do not know how we of Helium love the members of our ruling house, cannot appreciate the horror with which I can contemplate such an unholy alliance. What can be done, John Carter? he continued. You are a resourceful man. Can you not think of some way to save Helium from this disgrace? If I can come within a sword's reach of Sabthan, I answered, I can solve the difficulty so far as Helium is concerned. But for personal reasons, I would prefer that another struck the blow that frees Dejah Thoris. Cantos Can eyed me narrowly before he spoke. You love her, he said. Does she know it? She knows it, Cantos Can, and repulses me only because she is promised to Sabthan. The splendid fellow sprang to his feet and, grasping me by the shoulder, raised his sword on high, exclaiming, And had the choice been left to me, I could not have chosen a more fitting mate for the first princess of Barsoom. Here is my hand upon your shoulder, John Carter, and my word that Sabthan shall go out at the point of my sword for the sake of my love for Helium, for Dejah Thoris, and for you. This very night I shall try to reach his quarters in the palace. How? I asked. You are strongly guarded, and a quadruple force patrols the city. He bent his head in thought a moment, then raised it with an air of confidence. I only need to pass these guards, and I can do it, he said at last. I know a secret entrance to the palace through the pinnacle of, of the highest tower. I fell upon it by chance one day, as I was passing above the palace on patrol duty. In this work, it is required that we investigate any unusual occurrence we may witness, and a face peering from the pinnacle of the high tower of the palace was, to me, most unusual. Therefore I drew near and discovered that the possessor of the peering face was none other than Sabthan. He was slightly put out at being detected, and commanded me to keep the matter to myself, explaining that the passage from the tower led directly to his apartments, and was known only to him. If I can reach the roof of the barracks and get my machine, I can be in Sabthan's quarters in five minutes. But how am I to escape from this building, guarded as you say it is? How well are the machine sheds at the uh, barracks guarded, I asked. There is usually but one man on duty there at night upon the roof. Go to the roof of this building, Cantos can, and wait for me, uh, and wait me there. Without stopping to explain my plans, I retraced my way to the street and hastened to the barracks. I did not dare to enter the building, filled as it was with members of the Air Scout Squadron, who, in common with all Zodanga, were on the lookout for me. The building was an enormous one, rearing its lofty head of fully a thousand feet into the air, but few buildings in Zodanga were higher than these barracks, and though, uh, though several topped it by a few hundred feet, the docks of the great battleships of, of the line, standing some fifteen hundred feet from the ground, while the, the freight and passenger stations of the merchant squadrons rose nearly as high. It was a long climb up the face of the building, and one fraught with much danger, but there was no other way, and so I essayed the task. The fact that Barsoomian architecture is extremely ornate, 
made the feat much simpler than I had anticipated, since I found ornamental ledges and projections, which fairly formed a perfect ladder for me all the way to the eaves of the building. Here I met my first real obstacle. The eaves projected nearly twenty feet from the wall to which I clung, and though I encircled the great building, I could find no opening through them. The top floor was alight and filled with soldiers engaged in pastimes of their kind. I could not, therefore, reach the building, uh, reach the roof through the building. There was one slight, desperate chance, and that I decided I must take. It was for Dejah Thoris, and no man has lived who would not risk a thousand deaths for such as she. Clinging to the wall with my feet and one hand, I unloosed one of the long leather straps of my trappings, at the end of which dangled a great hook, by which air sailors are hung to the sides and bottoms of their craft for various purposes of repair, and by means of which uh, landing parties are lowered to the ground from the battleships. I swung this hook cautiously to the roof several times, before it finally found lodgment. Gently, I pulled on it to strengthen its hold, but whether it would bear the weight of my body, I did not know. It might be barely caught upon the very outer verge of the roof, so that my body swung out at the end of the strap, it would slip off and launch me to the pavement a thousand feet below. An instant I hesitated, and then, releasing my grasp upon the supporting ornament, I swung out into space at the end of the strap. Far below me lay the brilliantly lighted streets, the hard pavements, and death. There was a little jerk at the top of the supporting eaves, and a nasty slipping, grating sound, which turned me cold with apprehension. Then the hook caught, and I was safe. Clambering quickly aloft, I grasped the edge of the eaves and drew myself to the surface of the roof above. As I gained my feet, I was confronted by the sentry on duty, into the muzzle of whose revolver I found myself looking. "'Who are you, and whence came you?' he cried. "'I am an air scout, friend, and very near a dead one, for just by the merest chance I escaped falling to the avenue below,' I replied. "'But how came you upon the roof, man?' No one has landed or come up from the building for the past hour. Quick, explain yourself, or I call the guard. Look you here, sentry, and you shall see how I came, uh, and how close a shave I had to not come in at all, I answered, turning toward the edge of the roof, where, twenty feet below, at the end of my strap, hung all my weapons. The fellow, acting on impulse of curiosity, stepped to my side, and to his undoing, for as he leaned to peer over the eaves, I grasped him by his throat and his pistol arm and threw him heavily to the roof. The weapon dropped from his grasp, and my fingers choked off his attempted cry for assistance. I gagged and bound him, and then hung him over the edge of the roof, as I myself had hung a few moments before. I knew it would be morning before he would be discovered, and I needed all the time that I could gain. Donning my trappings and weapons, I hastened to the sheds, and soon had out uh, both my machine and Kanto's cans. Making his fast behind mine, I started the, my engine, and skimming over the edge of the roof, I dove down into the streets of the city far below, uh, far below the plain usually occupied by the air patrol. In less than a minute, I was settling safely upon the roof of our apartment beside the astonished Cantos Can. I lost no time in explanations, but plunged immediately into a discussion of our plans for the immediate future. It was decided that I was to try to make helium while Cantos Can was to enter the palace and dispatch Sab Than. If successful, he was then to follow me. He set my compass for me, a clever little device which will remain steadfastly fixed upon any given point on the surface of Barsoom. And by uh, bidding each other farewell, we rose together and sped in the direction of the palace, which lay in the route which I must take to reach Helium. 
As we neared the high tower, a patrol shot down from above, throwing its piercing searchlight full upon my craft, and a voice roared out a command to halt, following with a shot as I paid no attention to his hail. Canto's can dropped quickly into the darkness, while I rose steadily and at terrific speed raced through the Martian sky, followed by a dozen of their air, air scout craft which had joined the pursuit, and later by a swift cruiser carrying a hundred men and a battery of rapid-fire guns, by twisting and turning my little machine, now rising, now falling, I managed to elude their searchlights most of the time. But I was also losing ground by these tactics, and so I decided to hazard everything on a straightaway course and leave the result to fate and the speed of my machine. Canto's can had shown me a trick of gearing, which is known only to the Navy of Helium, that greatly increased the speed of our machines, so that I felt sure I could distance my pursuers if I could dodge their projectiles for a few moments. As I sped through the air, the screeching of the bullets around me convinced me that uh, only by a miracle could I escape, but the die was cast, and throwing on full speed, I raced a straight course toward Helium. Gradually, I left my pursuers further and further behind, and I was just congratulating myself on my lucky escape when a well-directed shot from the cruiser exploded at the prow of my little craft. The concussion nearly capsized her, and with a sickening plunge, she hurtled downward through the dark night. How far I fell before I regained control of the plane, I do not know, but I must have been very close to the ground when I started to rise again, as I plainly heard the squealing of animals below me. Rising again, I scanned the heavens for my pursuers, and, finally making out their lights far behind me, saw that they were landing evidently in search of me. Not until their lights were no longer discernible did I venture to flash my little lamp upon my compass, and then I found to my consternation that a fragment of the projectile had utterly destroyed my only guide, as well as my speedometer. It was true I could follow the stars in the general direction of helium, but without knowing the exact location of the city, or the speed at which I was traveling, my chances of, for finding it were slim. Helium lies a thousand miles southwest of Zadanga, and with my compass intact I should have made the trip, barring accidents, in between four and five hours. As it turned out, however, morning found me speeding over the vast expanse of Dead Sea Bottom after nearly six hours of continuous flight at high speed. Presently a great city showed before me, but it was not Helium, as that alone of all Barsoomian metropolises consists in two immense circular walled cities about 75 miles apart, and would have been easily distinguishable from the altitude at which I was flying. Believing that I had come too far to the north and west, I turned back in a southeasterly direction, passing during the forenoon several other large cities, but none resembling the description which Cantos Can had given me of Helium. In addition to the twin city formation of Helium, another distinguishing feature is the two immense towers, one of vivid scarlet rising nearly a mile into the air from the center of one of the cities, while the other of bright yellow and of the same heights marks her sister. Chapter 24 Tars Tarkas Finds a Friend About noon I passed low over the great dead city of ancient Mars, and as I skimmed out across the plain beyond, about, uh, across the plain beyond I came full upon several thousand green warriors engaged in a terrific battle. Scarcely had I seen the then a volley of shots was directed at me, and with the almost unfailing accuracy of their aim, my little craft was instantly a ruined wreck, sinking erratically to the ground. 
I fell almost directly in the center of the free of the fierce combat <clears throat> among warriors who had not seen my approach, so busily were they engaged in life and death struggles. The men were fighting on foot with long swords, while an occasional shot from a sharpshooter on the outskirts of the conflict would bring down a warrior who might for an instant separate himself from the entangled mass. As my machine sank among them, I realized that it was fight or die, with good chances of dying in any event. And so I struck the ground uh, with drawn longsword, ready to defend myself as I could. I fell beside a huge monster who was engaged with three antagonists, and as I glanced at his fierce face, filled with the light of battle, I recognized Tars Tarkas, the Thark. He did not see me, as I was a trifle behind him, and just then the three warriors opposing him, and whom I recognized as Warhoons, charged simultaneously. The mighty fellow made quick work of one of them, but in stepping back for another thrust, he fell over a dead body behind him, and was down and at the mercy of his foes in an instant. Quick as lightning they were upon him, and Tars Tarkas would have been gathered to his father's in short order had I not sprung before his prostrate form and engaged his adversaries. I had accounted for one of them when the mighty Thark regained his feet and quickly settled the other. He gave me one look, and a slight smile touched his grim lips, as, touching my shoulder, he said, I would scarcely recognize you, John Carter, but there is no other mortal upon Barsoom who would have done what you have done for me. I think I have earned, I have learned that there is such a thing as friendship, my friend. He said no more, nor was there opportunity, for the Warhoons were closing in about us, and together we fought, shoulder to shoulder, during all that long, hot afternoon, until the tide of battle turned, and the remnant of the fierce Warhoon horde fell back upon their thoats and fled into the gathering darkness. Ten thousand men had been engaged in that titanic struggle, and upon the field of battle lay three thousand dead. Neither side asked or gave quarter, nor did they attempt to take prisoners. On our return to the city after the battle, we had gone directly to Tars Tarkas's quarters, uh, where I left, uh, where I was left alone while the chieftain attended the customary council, which immediately follows an engagement. As I sat awaiting the return of the green warrior, I heard something move in an adjoining apartment, and as I glanced up, there rushed suddenly upon me a huge and hideous creature which bore me backward upon a pot, the pile of silks and furs upon which I had been reclining. It was Woola. Faithful, loving Woola. He had found his way back to Thark, and, as Tars Tarkas later told me, had gone immediately to, find, to my former quarters, where he had taken up his pathetic and seemingly hopeless watch for my return. Tal Hajas knows that you are here, John Carter, said Tars Tarkas, on his return from the Genix quarters. Sarkoja saw and recognized you as we were returning. Tal Hajas has ordered me to bring you before him tonight. I have ten thoughts, John Carter. You may take your choice from, from among them, and I will accompany you to the nearest waterway that leads to Helium. Tars Tarkas may be a cruel green warrior, but he can be a friend as well. Come, we must start. And when you return, Tars Tarkas, I asked. The wild Kalats, possibly, or worse, he replied, Unless I should chance to have the opportunity I have so long waited of battling with Tal Hajas. We will stay, Tars Tarkas, and see Tal Hajas tonight. You shall not sacrifice yourself, and it may be that tonight you can have the chance you wait. He objected strenuously, saying that Tal Hajas often flew into wild fits of passion at the mere thought of, a, of the blow I had dealt him and that, if he ever laid his hands upon me, I would be subjected to the most horrible tortures. While we were eating, 
I repeated to Tars Tarkas the story which Sola had told me that night upon the sea bottom during the march to Thark. He said but little, but his great the great muscles of his face worked in passion and in agony at recollection of the horrors which had been heaped upon the only thing he had ever loved in all his cold, cruel, terrible existence. He no longer demurred when I suggested that we go before Tal Hajas, only saying that he would like to speak to Sarkoja first. At this request I accompanied him to her quarters, and the look of venomous hatred she cast upon me was almost adequate recompense for any future misfortune this accidental return to Thark might bring me. Sarkoja, said Tars Tarkas, Forty years ago you were instrumental in bringing about the torture and death of a woman named Gazova. Go Gozava. I have just discovered that the warrior who loved that woman has learned of your part in the transaction. He may not kill you, Sarkocha. It is not our custom. But there is nothing to prevent him from tying one end of a strap about your neck and the other end to a wild thoat merely to test your fitness to survive and help perpetrate our race. Having heard that he would do this on the morrow, I thought it only right to warn you, for I am a just man. The river Is is but a short pilgrimage, Sarkoja. Come, John Carter. The next morning, Sarkoja was gone, nor was she ever seen after. In silence, we hastened to the Genix Palace, where we were immediately admitted to his presence. In fact, he could scarcely wait to see me, and was standing erect upon his platform, glowering at the entrance as I glowering at the entrance as I came in. Strap him to the pillar! He shrieked. We shall see who it who it is dares strike the mighty Tal Hajas. Heat the irons. With my own hands I shall burn the eyes from his head, that he may not pollute my person with his vile gaze. Chieftains of Thark, I cried, turning to the assembled council and ignoring Tal Hajas. I have been a chief among you, and today I have fought for Thark shoulder to shoulder with her greatest warrior. You owe me, at least, a hearing. I have won that much today. You claim to be just, people. Silence, roared Tal Hajas. Gag the creature and bind him as I command. Justice, Tal Hajas, exclaimed Lorquas Batomel. Who are you to set aside the customs of ages among the Tharks? Yes, justice, echoed a dozen voices. And so, while Tal Hajas fumed and froth, I continued. You are a brave people, and you love bravery. But where was your mighty Jeddak during the fighting today? I did not see him in the thick of battle. He was not there. He rends defenseless women and little children in his lair. And how recently has one of you seen him fight with men? Why, even I, a midget beside him, felled him with a single blow of my fist. Is it of that the Tharks fashion their jeddaks? There stands beside me now a great Thark, a mighty warrior and a noble man. Chieftains, how sounds Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark? A roar of deep-toned applause greeted this suggestion. It but remains for this council to command, and Tal Hajas must prove his fitness to rule. Were he a brave man, he would invite Tars Tarkas to combat. For he does not love him, but Tal Hajas is afraid. Tal Hajas, your Jeddak, is a coward. With my bare hands I could kill him, and he knows it. After I ceased, there was a tense silence as all eyes were riveted upon Tal Hajas. He did not speak or move, but the blotchy green of his countenance turned livid, and the froth froze upon his lips. Tal Hajas, said Lorquas Batamal in a cold, hard voice, 
Never in my long life have I seen a Jeddak of the Tharks so humiliated. There could be but one answer to this arraignment. We wait it. And still Tal Hodges stood as though petrified. Chieftains, continued Lorquas Patamal, shall the Jeddak Tal Hodges prove his fitness to rule over Tars Tarkas? There were twenty chieftains about the rostrum, and twenty swords flashed high in ascent. There was no alternative. That decree was final, and so Tal Hajus drew his long sword and advanced to meet Tars Tarkas. The combat was soon over. With his foot upon the neck of the dead monster, Tars Tarkas became Jeddak among the Tharks. His first act was to make me a full-fledged chieftain with the rank I had won by my combats of the first few weeks of my captivity among them. Seeing the favorable disposition of the warriors towards Tars Tarkas, as well as toward me, I grasped the opportunity to enlist them in my cause against Zodanga. I told Tars Tarkas the story of my adventures, and in a few words had explained to him the thoughts I had in mind. "'John Carter makes a proposal,' he said, addressing the council, "'which meets with my sanction. "'I shall put it to you briefly. "'Deja Thoris, the Princess of Helium, who was our prisoner, "'is now held by the Jeddak of Zodanga, "'whose son she must wed to save her country from devastation "'at the hands of the Zodangan forces. "'John Carter suggests that we rescue her and return her to Helium.' The loot of Zodanga would be magnificent, and I have often thought uh, that uh, had we an alliance with the people of Helium, we could obtain sufficient assurance of sustenance to permit us to increase the size and frequency of our hatchings, and thus become unquestionably supreme among the green men of all Barsoom. What say you? It was a chance to fight, an opportunity to loot, and they rose to the bait as a speckled trout to a fly. For Tharks, they were wildly enthusiastic. Before another half hour had passed, twenty mounted messengers were speeding across dead sea bottoms to, to call the hordes together for the expedition. In three days, we were on the march towards Zodanga, one hundred thousand strong, as Tars Tarkas had been able to enlist the services of three smaller hordes on the promise of the great loot of Zodanga. At the head of the column I rode beside the great Thark, while at the heels of my mount trotted my beloved Woola. We traveled entirely by night, timing our marches so that we camped during the day at deserted cities where, even to our beasts, we were all kept indoors during the daylight hours. On the march, Tars Tarkas, through his remarkable ability and statesmanship, enlisted 50,000 more warriors from various hordes, so that ten days after we set out, we halted at midnight outside the great walled city of Zodanga, 150,000 strong. The fighting strength and efficiency of this horde of ferocious green monsters was equivalent to ten times their number of red men. Never in the history of Barsoom, Tars Tarkas told me, had such a force of green warriors marched to battle together. It was a monstrous task to keep even a semblance of harmony among them, and it was a marvel to me that he got them to the city without a mighty battle among themselves. But as we neared Zodanga, their personal quarrels were submerged by their greater hatred for the Red Men, and especially for the Zodangans, who had for years waged a ruthless campaign of extermination against the green men, directing special attention toward despoiling their incubators. Now that we were before Zodanga, the task of obtaining entry to the city devolved upon me, and directing Tars Tarkas to hold his forces in two divisions out of earshot of the city, with each division opposite a large gateway. I took twenty dismounted warriors and approached one of the small gates that pierced the walls at short intervals. These gates have no regular guard, but are covered by sentries who patrol the avenue that encircles the city just within the walls 
uh, much as our metropolitan police patrol their beats. The walls of Zodanga are 75 feet in height and 50 feet thick. They are built of enormous blocks of carborundum, and the task of entering the city seemed, to my escort of green warriors, an impossibility. The fellows who had been detailed to accompany me uh, were of one of the smaller hordes, and therefore did not know me. Placing three of them with their faces to the wall and arms locked, I commanded two more to mount to their shoulders, and a sixth I ordered to climb upon the shoulders of the upper two. The head of the topmost warrior towered over forty feet from the ground. In this way, with ten warriors, I built a series of three steps from the ground to the shoulders of the topmost man. Then, starting from a short distance behind them, I ran swiftly up from one tier to the next, and with a final bound from the broad shoulders of the highest, I clutched the top of the great wall and quietly drew myself to its broad expanse. After me, I dragged the six lengths of leather from an equal number of my warriors. These lengths we had previously fastened together and passing one end to the topmost warrior, I lowered the other end cautiously over the opposite side of the wall toward the avenue below. No one was in sight, so lowering myself to the uh, to the end of my leather strap, I dropped the remaining thirty feet to the pavement below. I had learned from Canto's can the secret of opening these gates, and in another moment my twenty great fighting men stood within the doomed city of Zodanga. I found to my delight that I had entered at the lower boundary of the enormous palace grounds. The building itself showed in the distance a blaze of glorious light, and on the instant I determined to lead a detachment of warriors directly within the palace itself, while the balance of the great horde was attacking the barracks of the soldiery. Dispatching one of my men to Tars Tarkas for a detail of fifty tharks, with word of my intentions I ordered ten warriors to capture and open one of the great gates while with the nine remaining, I took the other. We were to do our work quietly. No shots were to be fired and no general advance made until I had reached the palace with my fifty tharks. Our plans worked to perfection. The two sentries we met were dispatched to their fathers upon the banks of the lost sea of Koras, and the guards at both gates followed them in silence. And that, my friends, concludes that chapter of Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, on Monday, it will be a holiday, and we are not actually in the library on Monday, but um, I will do a, uh, a reading, and uh, we will post it, uh, a recorded one, um, on Monday. So I hope you can join me for that again, uh, Monday at 4 p.m., just like, just like normal. And we will read chapters 25 and 26. As the story begins to wrap up, and John Carter and his friendly Tharks are about to attack the city of Zodanga. Well, I hope you can join me for that. Um, uh, have a great uh, weekend, and we will see you again. Take care, everyone. Bye.